An all Air Force crew prepares Atlas 544 for launch. This is the final Atlas research and development flight from the Cape. The 105th launch in the series, which began on June 11, 1957. The 82 foot tall stainless steel missile has two cameras installed to record liftoff. The Air Force crew moved smoothly through the countdown without a hitch. All systems were go. Air Force missile men train regularly with the industry team. Atop the 130 ton missile is a data cassette destined to be hurled more than 5,000 miles downrange where it will be picked up by an Atlantic Missile Range ocean vessel. 4.25 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, liftoff. The vernier engines burning on the sides of the Atlas indicate proper response to guidance signals, already pointing the payload to the proper point in space for hitting the pre-designated bullseye. The flight was successful. Data acquired by telemetry from cameras and from the instrument-laden nose cone complete the chapter of a book that began more than five years ago. This launch does not mean the Atlas will disappear from the Cape. It will be used as the booster for Project Mercury, Ranger, Mariner, and other space programs, including special tests conducted by the Air Force. This was the 11th consecutive success for the missile at Cape Canaveral. Atlas was the first of this nation's operational ICBMs. The Air Force regards the Atlas as a vital piece of hardware in the free world's deterrent arsenal and as a reliable workhorse in space probes and operations. A test missile in the Navy's advanced Polaris A3 development program was launched from its pad at Cape Canaveral at 19 minutes past nine on the morning of December the 6th. Primary objectives of the test were to be basic missile and guidance development. A malfunction during second stage powered flight of the A3 Polaris test missile caused it to be destroyed by the range safety officer. Exact cause of the malfunction would be determined by analyzing the telemetry data. The test missile was controlled in flight by a new lightweight guidance system developed for the Polaris A3, a 2500 nautical mile range missile which is scheduled to be operational by mid-1964. December 6th. An Air Force industry team, airmen of the 6555th Aerospace Test Wing and Martin Company engineers prepare the Titan II for launch from its pad on Cape Canaveral. The 103-foot Titan II, when operational, will be capable of launching from within hardened underground silos with extra duties as a space booster. One of the objectives of this flight was to test a varied payload under extreme conditions. The Titan II is powered by chemical fuels capable of being stored for fast reaction time and to meet the military requirements and exacting launch schedules of rendezvous missions in space. The Titan II develops a half million pounds of thrust and creates a new ignition pattern, reddish orange smoke and two jet-like streams of flame. Liftoff was at 3.31 the afternoon of December 6th and the mighty Titan was on its way. This flight fell short of its intended range, but preliminary reports indicated that many of the test objectives were achieved. The cause of the malfunction was not immediately determined. However, telemetry data, after complete analysis by the experts, will give the engineers the answers. The day began early for members of the 6555th Aerospace Test Wing. This was the morning of December 7th, and the Air Force team was readying another instant ICBM for launch. This is the solid propellant ICBM, the Minuteman. Countdown proceeded without a single hold. And the Minuteman roared from its underground silo 
at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. A perfect smoke ring, the Minuteman trademark, followed by an inferno of flame and smoke, precede the bullet-shaped missile in the observer's view. The all-inertial guidance system places Minuteman in ballistic trajectory. Today's all Air Force crew launched the Minuteman from its underground silo at Cape Canaveral with the objective of putting a re-entry vehicle into a target area about 3,500 miles down the Atlantic Missile Range. The relay, an active communication satellite, was designed to take the place of Telstar. The spacecraft was a walled octagon weighing 170 pounds. Its eight panels contained a great many solar cells which were designed to recharge three batteries. These batteries powered the instrumentation, electrical package, and communication experiments. On the 13th of December, at pad 17A, the countdown began. This day was the coldest in Florida for this date in over 80 years. But the four-hour range countdown proceeded without a hold. Experiments on this particular launch were to include one channel television and two-way communication signal transmission. The launch vehicle was the improved Thor Delta, with a high-performance Thor first stage an Aerojet Delta second stage, and an Allegheny Ballistic Laboratories Altair third stage. Liftoff occurred at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Flight of the missile was normal, with Bell Telephone Laboratories guidance facility controlling the initial phase of flight after 90 seconds. Separation of spacecraft from third stage and injection into orbit occurred 21 minutes and 11 seconds after launch. The apogee was 3,920 nautical miles and the perigee was 713 nautical miles. The orbit was satisfactory, circling the Earth every 184 minutes. The research and development launch set for today, December 14th, of the three-stage solid-fueled Minuteman used improved first and second stage motors. These longer range motors will be installed in Minuteman missiles assigned to the wing now under construction at Ellsworth Air Force Base, South Dakota. Ignition occurred at 10 o'clock the night of December 14th. The test, conducted by an Air Force industry team, was made to study missile performance in flight successfully launched, this Minuteman put its re-entry vehicle to a predetermined target area in the Ascension Island splash net, approximately 5,000 miles down the Atlantic missile range. Simpler and costing less than other ICBMs, the Minuteman is designed to be launched from within hardened underground silos. A Polaris A2 test missile modified to carry the advanced Mark II all-inertial guidance system designed for the newest model Polaris, the A3, was launched at 33 minutes past two Eastern Standard Time the morning of December 19th at Cape Canaveral. The new guidance system is about one-third the size and weight of the earlier model used in the operational A1 and A2 missiles now deployed at sea. It has performed successfully in tests flown earlier this year utilizing A2 missiles. Primary objective of this test was to gather further information on the performance of the new guidance system, smallest and lightest now in use in United States ballistic missiles. This flight successfully met all test objectives. A United States Air Force Titan II ICBM readied for launch from its pad at Cape Canaveral on December 19th. The second generation Titan was launched by an Air Force Missile Test Center team of 6555th Aerospace Test Wing members and Martin Company employees. Liftoff of the ICBM came at eight minutes past three on the afternoon of December 19th.
This research and development flight was planned to further test the missile's propulsion and guidance systems. The Titan II, which burns storable hypergolic propellants, generates about 430,000 pounds of thrust. As a weapon system, it will be on alert for firing from hardened underground silos with the Strategic Air Command. The 103-foot-high Titan II placed its re-entry vehicle in a target area approximately 5,000 miles down the Atlantic Missile Range. All test objectives were met. A successful 1962 finale for the Titan program. A third Minute Man was launched from its silo at Cape Canaveral during December. Launched at 7.35 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on December 20th. This Minute Man was aimed toward a point more than 3,000 miles downrange and was the first to use an advanced series nose cone. Conducted to evaluate the compatibility of this newer re-entry vehicle with the missile itself, the test launch also had as objectives the behavior of missile subsystems, and study of the inertial guidance system in flight. However, this particular launch fell short of its intended range. Preliminary reports had indicated that many of the test objectives had been reached. The cause of the malfunction, which made it fall short, was not immediately determined. But, as is the case in all research and development flights from the world's largest laboratory, Cape Canaveral, much will be learned from the detailed study of telemetry data.